Welcome to Let's Talk About It Sunday, an extension of KELA's weekday local talk show featuring a variety of subjects of local interest. This program was pre-recorded, so we're unable to take live calls on today's show. And now, let's talk about it. Welcome to Let's Talk About It. I'm your host, Peter Robarno, and I have a really fun guest today, someone that I've wanted to interview for some time now, especially because, you know, we're recording at KELA, and we're tied to KMNT, and it's country music, so you're going to be uh, really interested in this interview, so stick to it. Stay all the whole time through on KELA and KELAAM.com, or maybe you're streaming we're listening to 104.3 KMNT or KMNT.com. And today, my special guest is Chris Gunther. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so you and I were talking a little bit about uh, you before the show and talking about how, you know, there's a lot of people in the community who love your music, follow you, vote for you, whether it's best of or listener's choice, but don't know a lot about you and so that's what this show is about, to kind of get to know you, but not to disclose kind of the secrets, right? <laughs> yeah, some things are, uh, we got to keep, we got to keep tied up and quiet. It, can, right. yeah, on the down low, <laughs> so you still have that air of secrecy. So <laughs> let's start off a little bit about, you know, country music and how you got into maybe playing guitar, playing music and singing. So how did it all start? Well, our household, that I, the household I grew up in, it was kind of a musical uh, musical place. My mom was very, very musical, vocalist, guitarist, a drummer. Uh, my dad, uh, he, he'll tell you, he played the radio. That's his musical talent. But, uh, you know, he exposed me to a lot of different types of music. So there was kind of a an inspiration for the of interest in music. And it really wasn't until my teens that I got into, you know, singing, of course, coming through the public uh, school system and the music program as a percussionist. And then uh, in my teens, I started doing talent contests and singing and doing the vocals and, and learned to accompany myself. And through the FFA program, actually, yeah. was where I kind of got uh, kind of got my break. So where'd you go to school? Uh, Mossy Rock, and then uh, I graduated at WF West the last couple of years of high school. Did Did Mossy Rock have a good music program back then? They did, yes. And yeah. what? So what'd you play? You say percussion. What's What's uh, that for, per, for? So So drums and and all the other percussion instruments in 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 that uh, in that uh, genre, I guess you could say. And uh, so everything from auxiliary percussion, so shakers, tambourines, uh, triangle, uh, to timpanis and and uh, and of course uh, drum kit snare uh, bells not much on the piano at the time but all, all of those things in that in that uh, in that area i guess you could say uh, did you so did you learn to read music early on when you were t in, in in learning percussion and being part of the band a little bit actually i want to give a shout out to my high school music teacher d morton had a huge impact in getting me at, uh, into music she was the the teacher out there at the time yeah, and uh, you know a lot of what percussionists read are rhythms. So, uh, I you know a little bit of of reading some sheet music, but more on the rhythms, and uh, I know you feel a lot of it as well. That was what always made made the playing per, doing percussion work kind of uh, kind of uh, fun and interesting was that you could kind of feel the music a little bit, and you didn't always have to prescribe directly to the script at all times, but uh, definitely making sure that you were resting where you needed to be, but making sure that it was tasteful if you're in your spot, and then, you know, reading the sheet music and doing your best to do that as well. So you would say that percussion is a little harder than, you know, me playing the harmonica by numbers? I don't know about, <laughs> about that. I wouldn't say that, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot to it where you feel it. You, yeah. you feel the, the beat and the momentum of the music but from that you know and then of course a lot of those things you you apply i've st i still apply those things like on the last albums that i've done you know i i put a lot of percussion on there and it was yeah. it was it was great to get back in to uh, uh utilizing some of those skills that have been filed away on a shelf for many years so you started off doing that in moss rock with the percussion did you eventually, when did you pick up a guitar or jump in front of a piano and the keys? When did you start kind of branching out a little bit? Well, when I transferred, I didn't continue music at WF West. I kind of hung it up for about three years. Okay. And uh, it was in that time I just kind of focused on my own thing and, and learning guitar. I was singing and, and doing some vocal some vocals in ta local talent contests. And uh, 
I did a, I think it was my sophomore year of high school, I did a uh, FFA talent contest at, at Beasley Coliseum in Pullman, and there are about 3,000 people there. And yeah. you sing in front of a crowd like that, and, and you, you realize, well, hey, I, I impacted this group of people. And that was kind of a kind of a high you get on when you have a good, uh, a good you know, reception for what you're doing. And, uh, and then from that, I, I thought, well, you know what, singing the tracks and just doing vocals, I need to get to a point where I can accompany myself. And I'd kind of messed around on a guitar a little bit, but it really wasn't until I was a, you know, a senior in high school or a junior in high school where I really started devoting a lot of time to that. I mean, I'd stay up all night playing a guitar until my fingers bled just because I was <laughs> obsessed with it. You know? Yeah. When did you kind of realize you had, because you have a, a really cool voice. I mean, it's in, when you talk, it's that kind of deep, raspy voice. And, you know, for folks who don't know what you look like, it probably sounds a little scary. It's like, this guy's you know, like this country singer, right? But you've got, you've got a really good voice. And I know I have little kids. And my son, I love listening to him sing, whether it's at church or home in front of like an Alexa he always says, oh, I hate my voice, Dad. And I like his voice. So when did you like step out and just say, hey, I got a good voice. I'm going to start singing. That's a good question. Because yeah. I have a horrible voice. Like I know <laughs> for a fact you don't want to hear me sing. But there are people who are out there who I don't. I always wonder wh where that light went on where they're like, ah, I can actually do this. I got a decent voice. Well, I know when I was a younger younger kid, probably five or six, I, I would have a tendency to emulate what I would hear. So okay. that, you know, until my hearing started to get bad, you know, I had the ability to kind of do that as far as listening to pitch and tones and matching country singers that I liked and then just emulating what they would do. And I think that was noticeable at a young age. Uh, then the toughest part, the rest of your career is you're trying to get rid of that and you want, <laughs> you're, want to find and define your own sound so you're not sounding like everybody else. But... Uh, yeah, because I can imagine at a certain point, when, especially when you're a young singer and you're emulating other folks and you're kind of mimicking their style, it can become karaoke-like, and you're trying to just find your own voice and your own kind of style. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, you know, you, we already have a George Jones and a George Strait. We don't need any more of them, right? But definitely <laughs> borrowing ideas and, and things that they do stylistically that— uh, you know that uh, that that you know sells the goods and 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 it's those things that sound good. So certainly in influences and artistic debts. But yeah, you know you 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 go down those uh, those rabbit holes with right. these these artists where you're uh, you're learning and honing the craft and studying and and then eventually you're like, well, okay, I've learned enough from this one. Now I, I kind of got to start listening to something else, or you start becoming that voice if you're if you uh, if you swim around in that pool too long. Yeah, right? All of a sudden you wake up one day and you look like Elvis and you're in Vegas and that's what you're singing because you, you emulated <laughs> it so much. So when you were younger, did you always listen to country music? And then what was some of the country music you would listen to that really you gravitated towards? Well, I went through an Elvis phase when yeah, I was about there, seven. It was a oddity to everybody else. Like, Why is this kid like... Uh, like Elvis, but I, part of that was... No jumpsuits, though. Right? No, 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 right, no. Good. Well, we had a, my dad's work truck had an AM radio in it, yeah. and uh, they every Sunday uh, evening, the Elvis hour would come on, and that was an all-oldies. It was a Seattle station. The format's no longer the same. But, uh, you know, I learned and cut my teeth on all that 50s and 60s music, and then the Elvis hour would come on, and, you know, I mean, his music just powerful, just a great vocalist, and, I mean, he's the kind of guy that a guy wants to be like. I mean, that guy, you know, he was successful and uh, had some great songs, and, and uh, his music had shelf life. So yeah. I think I'm not sure what it was about that at that time, but I, that really resonated with me, you know, as far as, uh, as one of the early acts, and then I kind of... Uh, in high school, went through cassette tapes were on the way out, and yep. couldn't really afford too many CDs. But when you you know you could afford those cassette tapes at three dollars a piece, and so I just after school drive to every store I could just to find the discount bin to buy whatever I could get a hold of, and went through Merle Haggard music and Marty Robbins and Hank Williams was probably the second biggest influence that I had as far as just uh, studying and honing and listening to everything in the catalog until you know you you had it down and emulating that as well is it and, and is that what you recommend you know to younger artists and kids who maybe want to look up to you and say look he's out there playing music i want to do it too to try to expose yourself to as much kind of influences as you can find out what you like but really just kind of continue to to digest as much music that and, and then learning about the background of these guys you know what was their 
path to, or the route that they took. I think the interesting thing, too, uh, many years ago when I got into songwriting, Harlan Howard, uh, one of the more prestigious songwriters of his era, he had a whole website developed just for people like me that were starting out, trying to help burgeoning songwriters. And he had a point on there. You know, he listened to what he liked the best. And so Ernest Tubb and Hank Williams. But one thing I'd add to what he said is, is that listen, listening to the things that have shelf life, because not everything does. You know, right. a lot of music today will be forgotten about in three years, five years, a decade from now, but there's going to be something like Elvis or the Beatles or Merle Haggard or Hank Williams. It's, it's timeless and it yeah. won't ever, that won't ever change. Someone could redo those songs. Those songs are going to be just as good as they were then as they are now. Whereas there's a lot of stuff that comes out that we forget about and, and no one remembers it because it's just not memorable. It's just, it doesn't have shelf life. Right. The, the one hit wonders. Yeah. And even, th even then, even with the one hit wonder, some of them just had a kind of nice little beat to it, but you, you, I don't remember the artist, I don't remember the song, it just was there. So, which makes it almost even more impressive when you look at people like, for instance, George Strait or, or Merle Haggard or some of these others who just, I mean, not only did they make one song with shelf life, but I mean, their career had shelf life, that's crazy. Whole catalogs full of right. shelf life, yep. Yeah, so <laughs> what, what? growing up, what was one of your favorite songs? I mean, you talked a little bit about Hank Williams was somebody who had one of the biggest influences, Elvis is another, but what was a song that you, you listened to and you'd maybe play along to, one of your early ones that you said, yeah, this is one I want to learn? Well, that's a challenge because, you know, I don't necessarily know if there was one. There there have been many, many songs. You know, you study something that's really good or the way the, the songwriter put it together. A song that could say so much in only three minutes. And, uh, you know, you, you think about a song like that, like uh, uh, George Jones has a bunch. And, I, I mean, he didn't necessarily write them, but uh, A Good Year for the Roses, that's a great song. It says so much. It's a, such a deep song, and it can say it in three minutes, and you don't really have to sit there and wonder what what the heck they were trying <laughs> to say. Uh, um, the Grand Tour, He Stopped Loving Her Today, songs like, like that that can just tug at a heartstring and say so much in so few words those those songs are, are just timeless and it, it takes such talent to write a song like that if you're just tuning in to let's talk about it on am 1470 or 104.3 kmnt i'm your host of let's talk about it peter Rabarno, and my special guest today chris gunther we're talking country music and so stay tuned to the show. Uh, we'll be back after this quick break. You are listening to Let's Talk About It Sunday, an extension of KELA's weekday local talk show. Stay tuned. Let's Talk About It Sunday edition will return in a moment. Okay, and now back to business. Listen on the air and online. Good morning. You're listening to Let's Talk About It Sunday, an extension of KELA's weekday local talk show. This program was pre recorded, so no live phone calls on today's show. All right, we're back with Chris Gunther, and we uh, are talking country music. We're talking about uh, a little bit of the history and, and music that has shelf life. Uh, and we, we just talked about George Jones and so many other types of music and songs. What's your favorite song? I know. I'm putting you on that spot because you probably have like a hundred songs that you love for different reasons. We all do. But what what's one song that if I had to say right now, you got to listen to it, which one would it be? Well, I think uh, that a little bit of a challenge because you think about a, song, a singer's choice, what they would want to sing because of the way you can move vocals or a song just the way it's written. And there's a there's a song that Johnny Paycheck recorded kind of towards the end of his career uh, called The Old Violin. And I, I don't know why I like that song, but that's probably up there in my top. I don't necessarily know if that's the best one that I like or whatever, but it's in the top 10 there, I would say. And that when someone asks me at, at a show and, you know, if I do a cover tune, that might be something that I would throw out. It's a song. It's a song about country music singers. So it's uh, giving their life to country music. So that's uh, that'd probably be one of the the more favorite songs that have gravi that's gravitated to the top over the course of time. So not like Backstreet Boys or something? No, nothing oh, yeah. like that. <laughs> I do like Frank Sinatra's yeah. My Way. That's oh, another one. That's a dandy of a tune. That is a great song. Yeah, Frank Sinatra's great. And another, another non-country artist, but tons of shelf life. I mean, forever and ever, you're, he's going to have that. 
Um, what's one of the favorite songs that you like to play? That's not something you wrote and produced. Because we'll get to the next one. Well, you know, you, you, you can't go wrong with the uh, the crowd favorites, but uh, there's a lot of uh, songs that I do with fiddle when I play and uh, you know, Charlie Daniels music. You know, I think if if you're out at, at a club and you're trying to get people on the floor and something that's got energy, some of those old Alabama tunes that have fiddle in them or a Charlie Daniels number, I enjoy those just because you know what, you know, you can deliver the goods and you can get the audience inspired and maybe get people moving and plus kind of show your talent, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe those are multi, typically multi-instrumental songs where I'll play part of the song or on a guitar and the other half on a fiddle or something. So get a chance to showcase the talent a little bit. Yeah. And what about something that you've written? I don't know. I probably would say anything off my fifth album. Some of the new records that I put out, the uh, the Western tunes, I really enjoy just because there was a lot of time and thought that went into the, there was, a, they're all nonfiction <laughs> songs about uh, figures of the American West. And so there's a few of those that I really enjoy. I don't necessarily know that there's one that really sticks out per se, but uh, there's probably one on every album that I could go through the, you know, the process of saying, I think this is pretty good or this one I'm proud of or this one over the course of time is uh, has been something that the audience requests or prefers to hear every time I come out and about. But right. uh, and you have you have your discography online, right? I mean, you have a website. Yeah. What's your website so we could tell people now and they could even look while they're listening to the show? Yeah, it's uh, chrisguntermusic.com. And they can go to that and can they order all your albums online? Can they buy? Yep. Download options online. Of course, all the major uh, major streaming locations spotify and uh, amazon and itunes pretty much all the majors are you know you can download it or stream it and i do uh, even get uh, royalties if you play it on youtube so even if you want to go cut corners that way you're more than welcome get them some royalties play <laughs> play <laughs> buy it play it even on youtube what's uh so what are some of your favorite uh, gigs that you've done because you've i mean you've played you even said earlier you played out in pullman to three thousand, right yeah that was in yeah so i was actually in a talent program and then uh I went back to National FFA conventions. That was kind of when I got started, and the, and the, the music bug hit me. And back at Nationals, I uh, was in Kansas City at the time, and uh, that auditorium, you know, you're playing in front of 40,000 people. So that was the first taste of having a huge crowd. But I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, care whether it's a big crowd or a small crowd, just as long as it's a spirited group. And, you know, we just, uh, just celebrated our 25th year doing the music thing last spring, and and in that course of time, you know, especially here in Lewis County, there's certain places you like to go because there's there's new faces you can run into. Like lately, I've been going and doing a, quite a few shows out at Packwood Brewing Company. Oh, yeah. and a lot of tourists and things that uh, folks coming through that aren't necessarily Lewis County, but uh, you get to meet people from all over. And so that's kind of a, a unique place to play and a, an enjoyable one. There's certain rooms I like to play just because they're kind of an, a vintage room sweet hall love the sound of that yeah. that room uh city farm we pl played quite a few shows over there and uh you know nice state-of-the-art pa system in there and the room sounds phenomenal every time uh, not to say that then you know wherever i'm going sometimes you know uh uh, a venue might uh, surprise you. You might be going in there thinking it's going to be a sleepy night, and then, boy, it's on fire, and everyone's having a good time. And all of a sudden, you know, the local pub turns into something special. Yeah, so a ruckus. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Sweet Hall's pretty cool because it's got the wood floors and the creakiness to it. It's kind of got that old feel to it. I, I love Sweet Hall out in Rochester. Another, I, I just recently did a tour of the ten, one of the Tenino Quarries, the Hercules Quarry. And I was just telling them when I was out there with the Tenino Stone Carvers, how what a great place that would be for a venue because of the acoustics of the the quarry wall. Just a neat place. I mean, I I would just think, and again, I don't have an artistic or music talent at all. Um, but if I did, I'd want to play some of those outdoor venues that are just kind of cool. Certainly, yeah. And, and then there are a lot of you know uh, outdoor venues here in Lewis County over the years. You know. Uh, uh, the early years of the Garlic Fest out yeah. there, that was always an enjoyable time, you know, kind of the natural amphitheater out there when Sean Hamilton had the place. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Blueberry Fest there in Mossy Rock, give a shout out to them. Yeah. You know, they built that real nice stage a few years ago. It sounds really good there as far as something about warm night air and playing outside. There's always a good a good sound to that and travels well and sounds good. Yeah. No, I, I think that's great. Now, 
Chris, I got to ask you, like, who is one of the, you know, probably more famous people that you've run into playing? Well, I put you on the spot on that one. Well, thinking about playing. Well, you know, uh, many years ago, probably 20 years ago, I was in, uh, down in Nashville, and uh, Broadway doesn't look at all like it does today. Back back then, it was, you know, I mean, uh, the, the Ryman Auditorium had moved out of the area, and it was a little sketchy down there, but there was country bars, uh, not as many as there are today. And maybe not as much money coming through there, but every bar had traditional country music in it, and you could bar hop, no cover. You're just paying tips to get in there, and we were hanging out in there, and one of the guys that was up there playing, uh, he had a, a, a few guys, noted notables, that were players for other bands, and we got to know uh, Chris Ledoux's drummer, K.W. Turnbow, out of that, and being a big fan of Chris Ledoux and the Western yeah. Underground, we kind of got to know him, and we got backstage passes many times hanging out with k-dub and and the band that was a good Very cool. good good experience hanging with him i don't necessarily know uh you know a lot of those uh a lot of those opening and support act gigs are kind of very superficial right uh you get a nod and a handshake and you know maybe two minutes of someone's time and i mean i, I don't necessarily really need anything from those folks as far as maybe that handshake that's all you really need but you never really get to know anybody in those experiences because they're just very kind of short and, and quick and and uh, and then you go about your business or you go open the right. show or whatever but you know i met met a few of those folks never got to meet merle haggard when he was in town but uh, i did get a nod from him when i was sitting <laughs> out there uh, sweltering in the sunshine that was probably good enough for me we did a show with daryl worley a few years ago down in portland and we actually ended up closing his show so he kind of gave a shout out and uh when you know because we were closing the show up there as far as he he had was contracted to 10 o'clock and then we ended up closing it out till the early hours of morning lacy j dalton great great person great time there uh, we had a good talk and swapped albums that was a that was a memorable that was probably the very first uh, opener that i did new christy minstrels when i played with those folks um they wanted to the, the the folk uh, music thing is a little bit different than the country. They kind of want to bring you in and get to know you. Mm -hmm. And I was over at Centralia College a few years ago, and they're like, "Bring your guitar in and pick with us." And and then they, you know, it was all about telling stories and kind of getting to know you. And so that one was a little more personable, a little less superficial, right? Than some of the other experiences that I've had over the years. But it, it sounds like for you, it, just throughout this entire interview, it's been about uh, the crowd. Like, I mean, how important the people are who. Who, you know listen to your music and come out and enjoy themselves i mean you do it for them not for really anybody else certainly yeah i mean that's that's a huge part of it they're along long for the ride with you yeah yeah so when you're not on stage playing great country music what do you do i'm a high school uh vocational teacher right and then uh i, I try to balance the family in there somewhere yeah you know they you know that uh, that's always a challenge juggling those things and, and trying to make it make it all work but uh but yeah, the the agriculture teacher job, uh, FFA advisor, that's part of that. It's a coaching thing as well. And, and so that does take up a little bit of time, quite a bit of time over the course of the school year. And then in the summer months as well, you know, we yeah. have a lot going on uh, in the summertime. Well, and it seems like that fits within your personality and your interest, the FFA, because you've mentioned that throughout kind of your history of even just growing up, FFA is something that's important to you. Yeah. I mean, I know the impact it had on, on myself and then, of course, our family being involved in it. My sister was involved with it. All of my kids, you know, I try to encourage them and they've all kind of came through the program as well. And, and the value of not only, you know, the agriculture and the farming, but also just teaching solid communication and entrepreneurship skills. Yeah. I mean, I probably wouldn't really be treating music as the business that I've kind of built around that talent over the course of, year, of, of, of time but uh, but that kind of came out of that early experience coming through the FFA program and what that offered me in order to do you know what yeah. I do yeah and I saw you not too long ago at the Pacific Timber Congress big thing the, yeah, that we, going yeah on. We, we took some students out to that yeah. yeah that's pretty cool I mean that was pretty amazing to see yeah certainly a, gr a great way to educate folks that might not otherwise know what's going on you know and uh, 
and uh, yeah, the students that we took, you know, they they really had a good experience, you know, spending the day out there. Yeah, it was a good time. Well, I, I think part of too your career is that you know you're showing students that there's multiple ways to to be successful, judge success, and make a living and be happy. Right? I mean, music is an is a is an avenue, uh, you know, and then the CTE, the FFA, and all the other things that that you're teaching these kids. Uh, you don't always have to go the the college bound. There's career ready and so many different avenues for kids that really, I don't know, I, I when I was growing up, it was really college or nothing. It was everyone kind of pushed you in one direction. So you're kind of opening doors for kids in different kind of areas. Certainly. Yeah, there's, you know, there's all sorts of options and pathways. And, and that's one of the, the drums that I beat a lot is the, the importance of understanding, not necessarily how a student gets where they're going, but they stick that landing in the end. That's yeah. the most important thing that they're employable and that they uh they can hold a job and those soft skills that's just as much as part of you know trying to set students up with a, a skill set that specializes them in order to be more competitive in the marketplace or in the workforce yeah how, how long you been at wf west uh this is my ninth year there 18th year overall teaching but the ninth year there yeah and balancing family that's always tough yeah i know it's good having the kids coming through my program yeah. so i get to spend time with them there and then encouraging the kids to maybe do some music with me here and there when they're when they're able to yeah do they play uh the older the older four have have worked with me quite a bit on stage doing different things but uh the youngsters there i haven't gotten them hooked yet but uh how old are they four and uh Hazel will be six here this next month. So, yeah, yeah, so six, seven, right? That's kind of when you start to, Yeah. at least you notice. Yeah, and then they have an interest that you can tell, you know, just uh, when they when we do a rehearsal at the house, they're they're hanging in there with us. And they're playing around and, you know. Yeah, they, yeah they're, they're trying to, you know, keep a beat or, or I guess make noise of their own, but usually they're doing it in time with the music, so at least they, they have a sense of rhythm. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> more and more than I can say for me. My kids look at me like, are you kidding me? So are we going to see like a, a Partridge family kind of uh, episode out of you oh, guys? Or are you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. No, they actually, all the other, the, the kids there that are kind of still doing it. Uh, my oldest son there, he, uh, he, you know, will come in and play occasionally. Yeah. Uh, my other son's doing a solo thing uh, around the area here. And then my daughter, occasionally she does a, a, a solo act or a, a duo and uh and then the uh the 12 year old there she's uh she's uh helped me out doing some percussion work when cool. we've done like some of these uh i guess more uh ornate percussion songs on on my western records that i've put out here recently but yeah i mean they kind of are on call if i need them usually so that's kind of nice to have extra music in the house yeah do you have to pay them I do. I, I do my best to try to compensate them, yeah. That's, right. Uh, Little roadies carrying your stuff in, too? Well, yeah, I haven't paid them to do that, but... Uh, that That's free work. <laughs> <laughs> that's room and board. Yeah, that's right. Well, Chris, I want to thank you for coming in and sharing a little bit of your story about, you know, your music and, and your life. Again, I, I think this is one of those shows where people are going to be really interested in it. But I want to give you an opportunity to share your website again and, and let people know where they can get your music. All right. Yeah. So Chris Gunther Music dot com. And uh, you can find uh, links to the uh, streaming uh, sites off of the website, as well as uh, downloads directly off off the website as well. And your schedule, I imagine, is on there where you're going to be next playing yep. live. All the upcoming dates are under the shows uh, on, on the website. So, yeah, you can check out the calendar online as well. All right, that's Chris Gunther. I want to thank you for tuning in to Let's Talk About It on AM 1470 and 104.3 KMNT. I'm your host, Peter Abarno, on Let's Talk About It Sunday.